Hello, everyone. Welcome to Research Talks, Qualitative Scholar Conversations. We're happy today to have with us Johnny Saldana. Johnny has been a scholar with us at Research Talks now for quite a long time. We are honored and proud to have him as part of our team, and all of us are looking forward to joining today in a conversation with him. In addition to Johnny and myself, I'm Ray Mayetta, president of Research Talk. We have Paul Mijas, who is here representing not only himself as a Research Talk consultant, but also as uh, the, uh, would you pull your title at Odom? I'll let you introduce yourself as an Odom representative. Sure, I'm the uh, the assistant director of qualitative research at the Odom Institute for Research and Social Social Science at UNC Chapel Hill. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Paul. And Jeff, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jeff Petruzzelli with Research Talk. I'm a qualitative research specialist here. All right. So today what we'll do in our conversation is talk to Johnny about three courses he's offering at our qualitative research summer intensive. The first course is Fundamentals of Qualitative Research, and that will be offered Monday and Tuesday, July 22nd and 23rd. And then on August, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, July 31st and August 1st, Johnny will be offering Coding and Analyzing Qualitative Data. And the final course for the summer intensive Johnny will offer is a topic that Johnny has a book hot off the presses, right, Johnny? Uh, available for all of you to start enjoying, joining, uh, enjoying, titled Developing Theory Through Qualitative Inquiry. That's a one-day course on Friday, August 2nd. So we'll begin, actually, Johnny, I want to give you a chance to tell us more about you, if you can introduce yourself for folks, and included in that introduction, it would be great if you tell us a little bit about your evolution as a qualitative researcher. Oh, certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so appreciative of the research talk staff for uh, letting me be part of this wonderful program. I'm Professor Emeritus from Arizona State University in Tempe, and I focused primarily on theater education, uh, teacher preparation, grades K-12, in the School of Film, Theater, and Dance in the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. My work as a qualitative researcher actually began as a quantitative one because in the 1980s, when I joined the Arizona State University, University uh, department. My research mentor was wanting to conduct a longitudinal study on the way that young people responded to theater and the way they did improvised drama in the classroom. Now, at that time, my field was just getting uh, into qualitative research, but we were still in the quantitative paradigm. And so my primary function was to conduct a lot of interviews, but transform all of those interviews with young people into numeric representation and statistics. Well, by the time our longitudinal study was over seven years later, my field was now starting to turn into the qualitative paradigm. And so I was uh, kind of behind the times when it got to publishing our final reports. And everybody was kind of skeptical about all of my numbers. And during my sabbaticals, what I like to do is I like to take courses at the university for my own professional development. And because I was behind on qualitative inquiry, I really didn't have any kind of training in it. I decided to enroll in several courses. My first two were Tom Barone and Mary Lee Smith, who were very notable figures in the field of educational qualitative research. It was from them that I began my journey as a qualitative researcher. And then later on, my courses in communication with Sarah J. Tracy, who is also a research talk scholar, and Sarah Amira de la Garza also acquainted me with other qualitative inquiry methods um, and data analysis. So my journey as a qualitative researcher I actually began with taking courses from some very well-known people in the field, and I'm very grateful for their mentorship. Uh, and then uh, my work in qualitative inquiry began to be noticed at conferences and at workshops. And so I actually blended my background in theater with qualitative inquiry by approaching it, uh, not necessarily from a dramaturgical perspective, but I was bringing so much of what I learned about theater into 
my teaching of qualitative inquiry because uh, I was taught how to think symbolically, metaphorically, and conceptually. And those are the three basic skills that I try to teach in my qualitative inquiry workshops. I love the transferability and those three concepts are just so powerful, Johnny, it's great. Oh, and your experience learning from wonderful Sarahs and powerful qualitative people is great. Uh, Johnny, we want to hear about your coding and analyzing qualitative data course. It will be offered again at the summer intensive um, Wednesday and Thursday, July 31st to August 1st. Uh, this is a course that we have every year. It is one of the most popular courses, as you mentioned in your introduction about yourself. It also is dare I say necessary, uh, not only necessary, but also it's just something that folks um, find a bit mysterious if they don't get proper orientation to quali qualitative inquiry. So if you want to start off and just let us know a little bit about the origins of this course, possibly why this course, I think there's enough just of that little bit for you to um, chat more and introduce us to what you think and when you present the course coding and analyzing qualitative data. Right. Research Talk uh, commissioned this course because I had written the book, The Coding Manual for Qualitative Researchers, which is handled by Sage Publishing. And so uh, because coding is that kind of elusive process, what I did was I brought into the course for Research Talk different ways of approaching the analysis of data through coding. Coding has has over a half century of use in qualitative inquiry. And what I learned myself about coding was that when I took qualitative research methods courses in the 1990s, the textbooks at the time really did not explain coding very well at all. They addressed it in very general terms. Most of it was about grounded theory and that had a very limited repertoire of methods. And so uh, Sage, uh, asked me to put together a book proposal on coding. And after one unsuccessful attempt and a revision, I finally got it right. And they said, yes, this is the kind of book that the field needs. What I learned in my research was that there are multiple different ways actually of coding qualitative data. It's just that they never got collected together into a kind of a compendium or a manual. And so what I did for the coding manual was put together over 30 different ways that you could take a look at approaching data through the analytic method of coding. And what we're doing in coding is developing something that is a word or a short phrase that symbolically summarizes a larger datum. It really doesn't get any more complicated than that, but it's actually so many different ways that you can approach that summarizing of the data for later analysis. So with the coding manual, what I do is, because we only have a few days in these workshops, I limit the number of coding uh, exercises to approximately seven, ranging all the way from the most well-known, such as in vivo coding, which is using the language of the participants themselves, all the way up to causation coding, which is trying to understand the pathways of progress, change, process. Um, and we go through a series of exercises so that we get a, an understanding about how you can analyze data in different ways. Uh, every time I teach the course, I am so dependent on the evaluations from participants who give me very wonderful suggestions about different ways of approaching it. And the course has evolved over time to where what we do now is we analyze one participant's data throughout so that we're taking a look at the same participant, but analyzing that participant's data in seven different ways. And so that really gives us a good immersion in what it's like to take a look at a, a data related to one particular case. Uh, I think also uh, the origins of the course stem from the idea, again, that we're not taught qualitative data analysis enough in our coursework and even in our textbooks. And so because I'm the kind of person who wants people to really know 
what to do with the data once you've generated it, I make sure that we really focus a lot on uh, the analysis of qualitative data to try to reach new levels of understanding and insight. You know, one of the things that we hear a lot when people think about um, coding and they think about analysis is, is coding analysis, is it something separate? So one of the things I was wanted to just chat a little bit was that, and then the coding and analyzing, both of those on either side of the word and, yeah, there are attractive terms, but maybe a little bit about the and, so wherever you want to take that. Maybe that's a misnomer because coding is analysis, because yeah. what you're doing is some very deep thinking about how you can condense, not reduce, but condense a datum to its essence and essentials. But what's interesting is that qualitative data analysis methods are evolving. What will be different this particular year now from previous offerings of coding is how the newer digital technologies like chat GPT-4 is now influencing qualitative data analysis. Uh, I'm working on the fifth edition now of the coding manual for qualitative researchers. And Sage asked me, make sure you talk about the emergent technology in this particular edition. And so what I've been doing is experimenting with chat GPT-4 to find out how that platform's analyses compares to my own analyses. And it's been some very interesting things. Can chat GPT-4 do all the analysis? It can help with some basic things, but it's still lacking a lot of things that humans can do, such as critical evaluation, such as emotional intelligence, such as being able to have background and context about the data. So there are some limitations, but there are some advantages. And as I've been going through workshops and conferences, I've been attending those sessions where people are talking about artificial intelligence and chat GPT to learn a lot more about it. And the basic consensus is don't be afraid of it. Try to find out now how you can integrate it into your qualitative data analytic work. And so that's what I'm going to be doing at this year's coding workshop. That's a wonderful and timely addition. You know, on the word and, it's interesting too. I think a lot and have worked with many people for whom English isn't their first language. And it's a simple word we use a lot, but there's a slipperiness to it. Yeah. And in a way, it's a misnomer, but also when you think of the word and, absolutely the idea that, yeah, they're one in the same. And they're so I, I think it works, but I think just a clarification of in this context, here's what John is mm -hmm. saying by the word and. Um, yeah, well. I, I said that coding is analysis, but there are also other things that you do after you code. There's yeah. the writing of analytic memos. There is the process of developing categories or thematic statements or assertions. So even though coding is analysis, there are other analytic uh, functions and procedures that you do after coding and concurrent with coding as well. And that, that point is just so invaluable for folks. I don't want folks to read this title and then just assume, oh, I'll become a coder. It's mm -hmm. you're really learning and doing much more. It's funny when people take our courses, some folks will read the titles full, some people will read the descriptions and the bios of our instructors, do other research, and sometimes folks read the first word or two in the title. So thank you so much. It really, um, there's such a dynamic that beyond just simply put words into boxes in this course that it's so critical for folks to know that walking in. So. Another place we are thinking that really helps people think about when they're choosing courses and preparing to take a course is what does this course mean, A, for me when I kind of get back and I'm at my desk and now intimidated because I'm by myself. And then also when you think about how you mentioned earlier that codings existed with qualitative inquiry for decades the ramifications of the content you teach for the field. So whatever direction you want to go, again, with uh, those ideas, we'll just give you um, opportunity now to chat about that. Again, I bring my methods, education, and pedagogy into this. I'm a big believer in knowing the rules before you can break them. Twyla Tharp, who is 
as a well-known choreographer said, before you can think outside of the box, you have to start with the box. And mm -hmm. so I'm a big believer in, in uh, anybody who approaches qualitative inquiry, they need to know the legacy of the methods that we have um, in our literature. If coding is one particular method that we have, then we need to know all about it. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to use it all the time because I even stayed in my books and in my workshops. Sometimes coding is quite absolutely necessary for the task at hand, and sometimes it is most inappropriate for what it is that you're trying to analyze or find out. So I let people know when it's appropriate to code and when it is not. But I also let them know that you need to be able to have that foundation because it is a viable method. And from my perspective, it really does provide good insight. So there are times when you need to know that coding is available to you if other analytic options are not possible. And coding becomes essential when you're working with big data, especially. And so when you're working with uh, computer-assisted qualitative data analysis software, coding also becomes important. What's interesting is that you have to teach chat GPT for how to code. And so with the prompts, what you're doing is you're teaching it about such things as dramaturgical coding, which is taking a look at how we see social life from a kind of theatrical perspective, so that we're taking a look at, uh, at people's objectives, their conflicts, their tactics, and so forth. And after you teach ChatGPT what dramaturgical coding is, then you input the data and you can ask it to dramaturgically code for you. It presents information at a good descriptive level, but it doesn't go any further than that. And so what we need to do is we need to have the human touch to it to be able to take a look at what the output is and to say, okay, this is good, but I need to take it a step further. So by knowing the methods, you'll be able to utilize the technology a lot more effectively. Yeah, that's powerful information. Uh, uh, let me turn to my colleagues and see Jeff, Paul, um, any topics you want to follow up with, Johnny? Well, I, I find that sometimes people come to these courses feeling overwhelmed, especially with something like coding. And I find that they sort of leave with a lot of interaction. And I'm just wondering, um, with your with the coding and analysis class, you know, there are so many um, practices that you could choose from from your from the coding manual. I'm just wondering how how you decided and right, how you kind of um, uh, 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 make people so relaxed and um, allow them to kind of um, step away from the overwhelm. Yeah. Uh, one of my philosophies is, is it's better to do a few things well rather than many things poorly. <laughs> and so I'm very selective about which coding methods to apply. When I first taught the course, I tried to include the kitchen sink and I tried to cover as many things as I could. And the evaluations came in and those were very valuable in helping me streamline and really think about making the course a lot more focused. And so using a common data set is a way of helping people grasp the magnitude of what it is that we're trying to teach. But also at the same time, I'm giving them uh, what the methods are in broad brushstrokes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we acknowledge that in just 12 clock hours, you cannot possibly cover everything there is to know about a particular aspect of uh, research. And so I am very uh, specific in letting them know these are uh, small brush strokes of what it is about these particular methods. And here's where you can learn more. And so we acknowledge that we come into these kinds of uh, learning opportunities with the idea of just getting acquainted with the materials. So I try to do what I call high deep learning, where uh, things, if you will, go very high in terms of the conceptual richness and the analytic uh, methods. But we also go deep so that we don't just sort of gloss over the data, but we really try to take a deep dive into it. So I try to achieve those two objectives 
in very strategic ways by focusing on just a limited number of coding methods and staying with one particular participant's data set. And I found that pedagogically that helps people not be as overwhelmed. Thank you. Jeff, do you have any points of curiosity for Johnny or thoughts? Uh, I was just curious. Uh, you mentioned that, um, that your your book focuses on a, on about thirty different uh, you know aspects of coding and analyzing. I was wondering how you pared that down to uh, to seven or so that you cover in the course. What that process was like, and why those those particular ones made it to the course. I, I try to choose not just a diversity of different kinds of coding methods, but from my knowledge of the literature, which ones tend to be used most often. Like for example, uh, in vivo coding for me, just from my own perspective, that is my first go-to method, regardless of methodology, regardless of research question. I always do in vivo coding with interview transcripts because that keeps me very solidly grounded in the data because I'm using the participants own language as my codes. So that is a given. And in fact, that's the very first one that I cover in the course because it's one of the easiest ways, but it's also one of the richest ways of taking a look at interview data. Uh, some of the others that we cover are uh, stepping stones for grounded theory, since that tends to be one of the most well-used and well-known methodologies. So I make sure that I cover such things as process coding and uh, axial coding, for example. Uh, the others that I use are things like uh, dramaturgical coding, and people have told me they've actually been, hey, this is pretty cool. Uh, and so I bring, again, my own biases as a theater person, I want them to be able to look at social life as performance. And so that's why I focused on dramaturgical coding. And then I focus on causation coding because um, that is something that... Uh, is kind of discounted in the literature a lot. People, methodologists will say, well, we really can't track, you know, people's trajectories qualitatively. The best way is through quantitative measurements like path analysis, for example. And based on my own work, I want to say, uh, be careful about dismissing it because there are some legitimate ways of taking a look at how we can try to analyze causation in, you know, social action, reaction, and interaction. So I spent some time focusing on that particular method to uh, give people some awareness about how, yes, you can take a look at causation qualitatively. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny, for giving us more information about the coding analysis and qualitative data. As you know, the three of us have sat through the course several times. Every time it does evolve, it's so powerful. Really looking forward to the additions you have. It'll be a great opportunity for everyone. So thank you so much for that information.